And we're live. This is Plant Teddy Podcast, serving you intersectional horticulture. I'm Matthew. And I'm Steven. So we are super happy today to have one of our friends and ping guru, um, I'm going to call him that, Bob, here with us. Say hi, Bob. Hi. Um, we have been wanting to get Bob on for a while because pingicula are one of the... Pinguicula. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it's like we have miles right here for us. But this is one of the coolest carnivorous plants that are really unlike a lot of the others that you typically see with either like pitcher traps or snapping traps. They almost appear more like some of the succulents that you grow. They have beautiful color, and they are my number one uh, carnivorous plant to do with fungus gnats. Yes, so practical, very pretty, um, and I think they can be easy to care for, and hopefully Bob can help walk us through that today. Yeah. So before we get back into our topic and have Bob tell us everything that we need to know about this wonderful group of plants, uh, Stephen, do you have any plant updates? So as far as plant updates, I just got a bunch of super, super cool succulents from uh, the Cascade Succulent Society. Well, it's actually somebody who's a member there. Uh, he gave me a really cool one called Oxalis Gigantea. I'm really excited about that one. Um, the giant a, Oxalis. Uh, yeah, so it's kind of like a, it's like a tree kind of shrub-sized plant. It's like woody stems and little clovers and flowers coming off of it. I mean, I probably have a decade or two before it gets there, but I'm very excited. I'm basically imagining it's like the Brussels sprouts of Oxalis. <sighs> Okay, that's that's your version. I mean, like a Brussels sprout is like a branch with little cabbages yeah, on it. I, so this I is know, like a branch. This of I think is much cooler. Song. Okay, nobody has Brussels sprouts as as like feature plants, or do they? I don't know, but I feel like the Oxalis would make a fantastic feature plant mm, in a yeah. garden that nobody knows the species. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. How about you, Matthew? Uh, well, I. Um, I actually picked up two really beautiful Nepenthes. I haven't looked at their tags, so I'm not sure. They're both hybrids. Uh, but that was from the uh, Carnivorous Plant Society here in Seattle. And we just came from a meeting there where there were a bunch of growers. They were talking about the plants that they have. Everybody tends to bring like either cuttings or divisions to sell or trade. So it's a really great place to get some cool plants. And I'm really excited to see how these do. Yep, Washington Carnivorous Plant Group. If you find it on Facebook, um, join. And hopefully if you're local, come to a meeting sometime. Yeah, and Bob was there with us. So Mm -hmm. we'll have a lot of fun things to share. But before we dive into our topic... I just want to do my every episode update where I tell you to go find us on social media. So Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and Pinterest. You can find us as Plant Daddy Podcast and online at plantdaddypodcast.com. Steven's been doing a lot of work to get the website up to date. So hopefully that's going to be a great resource for you guys and you should check it out. We would also really love it if you could make sure to rate and subscribe wherever you consume your podcasts because this helps others find us and gets us higher in those rankings and numbers matter. So, yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, anything else, Stephen, before we dive into our topic? I think that's it. Okay. So, Bob, I'm so excited to hear about these plants. Uh, let's get going. Yeah. So, Bob, um, where did you get your start in, in gardening and plants? Well, I grew up in that? Iowa and my mom was a gardener. So really, I grew up with plants all around me. Uh, I wasn't all that much involved in it. For me, gardening meant more or less doing chores for mom. So she would pull a bunch of stuff out and it's like, Robert, take this and dump it over across the street. And uh, we did some weeding, but we always had also like along one building or something like around the garage, there was a, a little strip of annuals that my brother and I could plant. Although, honestly, it was usually mom doing the planting and calling it ours. Oh, but, okay. But nice. still, it was, it was nice. You know, I think the first thing I ever planted was a zinnia because that's what hmm. you do. And They're great. For, they come uh, up like zinnias. Seed. Yeah. yeah. Nice. What kind of gardening did your mom do? Was it mostly like ornamental? Yeah, mostly ornamental. I mean, the sort of the, the typical shrubs around the house, but then she had a big border along the back. And when I was in third grade, we moved to a larger place. And she had a really large garden. Uh, Mm -hmm. along the back corner of the yard and actually I just saw a picture of it on Facebook one of my former neighbors showed a picture and a lot of that stuff is still there wow Wow. I saw the irises that I used to walk along as a little kid and sniff everyone and yeah yeah, they're still there so 
That was kind of cool. What were some of her favorite plants? Um, well, let's say iris peonies. She was famous for her peonies, actually. Mm-hmm. And basically, That's in the Midwest, favorite. really? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I love them. Yeah, and in the in the Midwest, peonies are so easy, you know, as long as you got some sun. There was a big, mm-hmm. long row of them that she'd brought from the old place and put in. And everybody that would hear about where we live for the first time would usually say something like, oh, that's the house with all the peonies out front. So That's a good thing to be known for. Yeah, yeah. She she had beautiful peonies. And at some point you were bitten by the carnivorous uh, plant bug, right? When did that start? I'm trying to remember how old I was, probably fourth grade or fifth grade, because there was one of these garden catalogs and it had an offer of Venus flytraps. Like Mm -hmm. everybody, most people Maybe not everybody, but most people start with Venus flytraps. I think it was burpees. Oh, okay. I can't That's remember exactly, but it doesn't matter. But anyway, we got we got three bulbs of Venus flytraps. And, uh, of course, the, the sort of typical knowledge at the time, what they always told you was, they want to be steamy, wet, and put them in a um, put them in a terrarium. So I had a little okay. one gallon aquarium, those little molded ones, mm-hmm. and uh, that we killed goldfish in, you know, oh, <laughs> and yes. uh, and, and planted in peat moss. And the thing was, in Iowa, what we got as peat moss was Michigan peat. It was that really dark, oh. fluffy. Uh, it had nothing to do with sphagnum, and oh, so okay. it was mucky, awful stuff, and good for for amending your garden, but not for growing fly traps. And mm-hmm. we put it in a west window, and they grew for a while, and they were sluggish, and then they died. And mm. uh, so it was still a death cube. Yeah, it was. It was a larger death cube, <laughs> okay. but it was spacious. It was. You know, yeah. But uh, were you trying so, to feed them at that point? Or sure. Yeah. Was, was the soil too rich? Uh, it was just. It's. I think the Michigan peat isn't really acid. Okay. That's part of it, huh. and they want an acid. Yeah. They want an acid mix. So okay. it's not the typical bog kind of kind mm-hmm. of mix. And uh, and then I tried again, and there was I think it may have been Carolina Bi- Biological Supply Company. I don't know if you ever seen that catalog. Yeah. That was always a fun catalog every year, and they had kind of a once again a terrarium it was it was more like a little mini greenhouse with a tray and mm-hmm. and maybe good for certain things but there was this obsession with growing everything under under a tent i mean hmm. if you live in the southeastern united states in the summer you do feel maybe like you are under a plastic tent it is <laughs> yeah, it was, is hot and humid but climate. not the kind of rainforest you know they're not rainforest plants mm-hmm. and the biggest problem is also uh, that they need a lot more light than you mm-hmm. can give them in the house when you're talking about fly traps and pitcher plants, was what, which is what I was growing. And so basically watch them die too. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't until I must have been 15 or 16, and I was down in North Carolina visiting my grandparents down there, and I had never seen the ocean, so I got on a bus and went to Myrtle Beach. Wow. And I think my grandparents were moving over into the edge of senility and that's why they let this 16 year old kid or 17 year old kid get on a bus and take off to Myrtle Beach and then I I got to Myrtle Beach and I thought I'm really close to uh, Wilmington and that's the epicenter for Venus flytraps I want to go see Venus flytraps in a while I had no idea where to go I mean you don't just go to Wilmington and walk down the street and there's Venus flytraps growing and yeah and it doesn't work that way um, but anyway, I got there, and it was kind of a seedy part of town because it's a bus station, right? Yep. And I called my grandparents and told them, oh, I'm in Wilmington. And it's like, Wilmington? What are you doing in Wilmington? <laughs> oh, God. Anyway, so at the time, it was all in the hands of a Mr. Northrup. The Northrup family owned all this land down there. Wow. And, they, and a lot of the Venus flytraps were being ripped up out of the wild. Hmm. And it, it's, well, it was long before the days of tissue culture. So... It was a concern, but but anyway, I called him up and uh, he said, you know, "So who are you? You you what? You you came all the way out here to? Uh, I, I I wanted to go see Wait, at see this the point, nursery. Were you at the bus station. Still? I was at the I was at the bus station, <laughs> oh and uh, wow. And so I you know I called him up and and he said after we talked a little bit, I was asking how to get out there, mm-hmm. and he said you you came all the way over here to. Uh, to look at flat traps and I said yeah and he said 
you just sit tight, I'll come get you. Oh, and so he did. Wow. And he took me out there and it was amazing. And they were raising all sorts of other plants, but all in the ground. Mm -hmm. So it was the first time I'd ever seen pitcher plants growing in the ground and just walking along a path through That's a field amazing. and here's a bunch of venus fly traps there and wow, wow so yeah and he was he sold them to me really cheap i brought luca fella i brought all sorts of you know saracenias and brought them home and grew them for a couple years uh in wow. iowa in iowa the winter dormancy was rather an issue because it gets down to negative mm -hmm. 20 yeah you know easily sometimes negative 30 where i live so mm -hmm. it's well below yeah. their hardiness yeah exactly so you know you have to find a place in your garage or something to put them and that was just kind of a balancing act and um i wasn't good at balancing it but. still it's impressive i mean taken from the wild right and multiple years you kept them alive that's impressive well two years okay. so <laughs> one winter still, the next I mean, winter yeah, they like, that was it that okay. but, <laughs> kind of like but this is a more innocent time when you could just like do this without getting mugged at the bus station or well something. there's a lot yeah. that i would revise actually, yeah. I think in some, <laughs> yeah in some it may have been actually been worse than like but, that's uh, how kids disappear okay yeah but <laughs> <Okay>. you know <laughs> so you know a little senility in your grandparents and uh, perfect uh, yeah put some plants perfect. you can do anything so, but uh but, yeah side, now most people get into plants I mean, yeah they weren't that far along at that time, okay. but uh, uh, anyway, so, uh, so then yeah. for, I moved to Illinois and I said I always liked plants, but I didn't have much place to garden myself. Mm -hmm. And I was really into the aquarium hobby and all, but, uh, but um, then when I came to Seattle, we have this wonderful mild winter here and you can grow so many things outside. So as soon, pretty much as soon as I had a place where I could really do some consistent outdoor gardening. I started raising Saracenias again, and uh, I'm not sure if I, fly traps I think were too mundane for me at the time, but okay. uh, yeah. now, I, now I raise all sorts of fly traps. Yeah, uh, and you know, I have felt that way too, kind of in my journey with these carnivorous mm -hmm. plants as well. I loved them at first, then I'm like, oh, these are so ordinary, and then I sort of return to them. Because everybody's got a fly trap, oh, right? Yeah. yeah. Do you think that that has to do with it's like a single species genus, so there's diversity in cultivars that has begun to blossom mm -hmm. recently, but for a long time it was just, well, you can grow the straight species or you can pick anything else. Yeah, and maybe just because it was because it was the first thing I started with and, yeah. and uh, I'd killed a bunch of them and didn't really know the, the details of them. Mm -hmm. That was part of it as well. Interesting. Yeah. Um, because cephalotus, for example, only has one species too, and, yeah. and there are some different varieties out there. But a lot of people like to make fun of cephalotus people because they say, "Well, they're really not that different from one another. One has, you know, two centimeters or two millimeters wider peristome yeah. or something, and suddenly it's like wide peristome variety." I yeah. tend to look at it that way. Yeah, I don't know if that's. But, I mean, it's not. It's not not worth calling out the difference, but I wouldn't. Yeah, I mean, some of them are, are, you know, they're interesting. Yeah. But uh, cephalotus is still one of my all-time favorite plants. And, and this is one of the South American pitcher. Oh, cephalotus plants. is Australian. Australian. Oh, yeah. What did I say? Uh, South, South America. Oh, well, I meant to say Australian. Yeah. We're Bad <laughs> carnivorous <laughs> plant grower. We're keeping well, it in there. I don't have there. any. We're keeping it in there. We're not editing that out. Stephen, okay. you're a genius with editing. That's right. Can't you make me sound smart? <laughs> um, yeah, but they kind of look a bit like a Nepenthes, but also a little bit. maybe a little bit yeah. like a Helium Fora. Yeah, like, like there are some things about them that are interesting. Well, they've got the ribbed peristome. And yeah. That okay. sounds it's, dirty. But, but the, yeah. The topic at hand mm -hmm. Mexican pings. Yes. How did you get into pings, Bob? Well, it was kind of a late development, really, because mm -hmm. in the time I was growing all these other carnivorous plants, the one group of plants that I never was much interested in was, was pinguicula. Hmm. And when I was a kid, there wasn't all that much available. Uh, sometimes you could get like a vulgaris or one of the North American pinguiculas. Okay. And yeah, they're a little more involved. They need a winter rest. And that's also... Actually, they probably could have taken an Iowa winter since they grow up on mountain yeah, tops. But, yeah. but I was just never all that interested in them. I mean, it's funny because we were being snobby about Venus flytraps because they're too mundane. But a, a ping, the first time you look at it, it they look pretty mundane. Yeah. I mean, they look like an African violet basically yeah. I, I, with I've a flower they kind of look like primulina or like yeah a little bit yeah. and uh 
And so, you know, there's not really any clever looking moving parts. The mm -hmm. Drosera has its tentacles and drops of glue. Uh, Ping just kind of lies there and waits for things to land on it. Yeah. And then it pours out digestive juices and consumes it. But uh, it's not as obvious as some of the other carnivorous plants are. Yeah. Certainly if you're like a little kid, I remember the first time I saw a cephalotus, it just blew my tiny mind that, that yeah. something like that existed. Where pings are just so believable. Uh, <laughs> it's true, know? no. Yeah. I, I, and I, so it wasn't until quite a bit later well actually in seattle here and we did have a carnivorous plants group together then mm -hmm. this was in kind of early mid 90s i suppose okay yeah mid 90s to late 90s and somebody gave me a uh, a moronensis variety one that i would love to find again it was really a nice one mm. the deep deep dark purple flower really narrow petals and wow. uh, and yeah. kind of pinkish leaves with darker veins. It was very that nice. sounds great. And I've never seen it again. Uh, I keep asking people about it, and they're probably tired of hearing about it. But anyway, <laughs> uh, so I grew that one for a while, and I did eventually kill it. And then I left the country. I lived in, in Turkey for about 14 years. And I did raise some plants there, but didn't really, not too much. And I had actually taken a morinensis with me mm. on from a trip back, and... It was actually doing okay, but then some event happened. Something got into the water. I was using city water, which okay. was mostly trying to avoid that. But one week, everything I had died. Wow. And so no. that was the last of pings for a while. And then I came back here and started looking at growing some carnivor carnivorous plants again. And, uh, and, in the meantime, a lot more plants have been ava uh, become available. Hmm. So, whereas we used to have Morinensis, and that was pretty much it. Uh, I didn't see any other pings back in the 90s. Suddenly, there's a lot of pings being grown, and I saw Cyclosecta, and I thought, wow, that's a really cool-looking plant. Yeah. And, you know, I grow other plants, too. I don't just grow carnivorous plants. So, I can appreciate a plant uh, just for its form and its color. It doesn't have to like kill other life forms, you know, for me to okay. like it. <laughs> yeah. um, what was but it about Cyclosecta? Cyclosecta is just such a, it's not a huge one, but it has this, I know, the form of it and and the dark purple color the of purple's the leaves. It's really, me, it's yeah. an unusual plant. It just stands out. And a friend of mine actually had, had a ping that he thought was a Morinensis, but it was hard to tell because pings can grow in sometimes really adverse conditions. Uh, the ideal conditions might be fairly bright, but he was growing it in, I guess, an east window, but it was completely shaded. It may as well have been a north window hmm. with with bushes over in front of it. It wow. was so dark, and it grew and it bloomed. It's like, that's kind of cool. Okay. And uh, and he said, well, want a piece of it? And I said, sure, and he gave me a huge chunk. It was several, um, several uh, different ones, and so as I, I took it home and I got it into better light and I really liked the color that it, that it, uh, it produced, and I said, well, maybe it's time to grow a few more. And I found a local, um, uh, local company that, mm -hmm. that sells a lot of pings and they had Cyclosecta, so let's get one of those. And, and it just kind of snowballed from there. I think I got three or four. And, and then, well, there's, those are cool. And so I started getting a few other ones as well. Yeah. And then uh, started trading with people. And they're pretty easy to propagate. And we'll get yeah. to that. And so, yeah, before I knew it, I had lots and lots of them. And then also there's the blooms on them. And some of the plants, I mean, like Nepenthes are, have amazing leaves. But the flowers, the flowers aren't too are much to write strange. home about. Yeah. Or Cephalotus is pretty boring. Venus flytraps and Drosera, some of them have nice flowers, but, you know, they're just kind of flower flowers. And yeah. uh, pitcher plants, Saracenias, have wonderful, wonderful blooms. But the the pinguicula flowers are really varied. And so that's yeah. kind of another milestone. You could grow it just for that. Yeah, I think that's true. Yeah, yeah they have really nice, I would say kind of cute, but amazing colors. I mean, yeah. there's, the foliage has colors, but then these, you know, these flower colors can be a different dramatic color yeah. as well like that really hot pink that matt likes so much oh, oh. yes well i i mean the one that blooms for me 
constantly has really hot pink flowers and i yeah. appreciate the hell out of how happy this plant is but i really wish that one of those beautiful purple ones that i got from you uh-huh. would have that kind of vigor because oh, i would much rather see that that regularly yeah right so and you kind of touch on this but you know how did these grow in the wild many of these are lithophytes right we're talking right. about mexican peas yeah so they're subtropical they tend to grow at higher elevations uh which is important and um so they're not they're not warm tropical plants uh they like a little coolness a lot of them grow on actually north facing rock cliffs oh i didn't know that not okay. only north but but a lot of them grow on north facing cliffs okay. the thing is a north facing cliff in mexico in southern mexico is a little different it gets more light than say a north facing vertical cliffside wood in the pacific northwest up sure. near canada here uh but uh but yeah so they 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 grow in areas where there's you know frequent frequent water in the summer generally mm-hmm. there's exceptions to that rule as well and um fairly bright usually kind of filtered light but there's some of them that get really bright direct light some of them actually grow with cactus and tillandsias in oh, some wow. areas wow yeah okay. so so, so yeah so there there's a lot of species i can't remember right offhand how many species there are now there used to be a lot and then a lot of them got lumped into moronensis and i can't even even come up with a number right yeah, now yeah i wouldn't but have an estimate. 40 or 50 or something like that so there's there's a lot of them and and they grow in a lot of different niches do you have a figure for like the proportion of the mexican species that are actually kept in cultivation is it pretty widespread among them i think i mean the percentage of of the ones that exist that we're that we're cultivating now mm-hmm. i think i think most of them are in cultivation there's a few new new discoveries yeah yeah i was gonna say i feel like yeah. there are new discoveries fairly like just often. just i mean for you know compared to just things. this week i read um simulans uh pinguicula simulans it's one of the wow. smaller ones it looks a little bit i think it's simulans like it, a monkey it, uh no it's like <laughs> similar Simu. simulans it oh. simulates oh okay. uh, yeah it looks a little bit like um uh, like Nivalis or Gracilis, it has that kind of an oblong uh-huh. white flower, but it's distinct as well. Okay. Uh, the first at first glance, you'd say, "Oh, that's a Gracilis," but so that's a brand new one. There's also some interesting new forms of things that that they find because, for example, Gigantia or Lawiana or yeah. one of these, they have a lot of different local forms. Mm-hmm. And there's a there's a red Gigantia Ooh, that everybody that. is lusting after oh. right now and. As far as I know, well, there might be a, one or two people in the States that are growing it now. I'm not sure. There's several people in Mexico growing it. Okay. Uh, sending plant material out of Mexico is a little difficult. And mm-hmm. so uh, they, it's not going to show up immediately, but it'll be around eventually. Okay. So, you know, some people I think are daunted by, right, the variety of this, maybe these, you know, summer and winter forms that they have. How do you tell people to take care of these in home, in the home? Okay, well, start out with just one if you're daunted with it, you yeah, know, yeah. daunted by yeah, it. That's my story. But <laughs> yeah, start out with one or two. I, I got you hooked, I think, didn't I? Yes, yeah. you're like, oh, hey, I and have this And as a matter of fact, the one that I gave you was that first one that I got from my friend. Oh, uh, really? That, that, yeah, that I still hybrid. have that. It, it's still in its summer form, oh. and it looks fine. It hasn't ever gone Never. into winter form Never. for you? I guess it's a, it's a warm long. it's it's under lights and and it's a warm apartment. Yeah, yeah. almost yeah. all my others have, but hmm. well, let's talk for a minute about those forms because yeah. we've kind of hinted at it. But what kind of drew me in as like the most fascinating aspect of these plants, the first uh, that I ever grew, I don't know what it was. I actually got it at the indoor sun shop, and I put it in a tropical vivarium, and it died pretty abruptly. Uh, I think there was just too much water on it, so it probably rotted. But mm. then Stephen gave me some offshoots of a plant that he had propagated, which was from you. I'm sure, yeah. Yeah. Maybe that and same one. Yeah. When I got it, it was in its summer growth, but you told me to expect that it might enter winter growth. And then since then, I've had some in winter growth. The winter growth, they look like true succulents because... Well, they are true They are succulents. true succulents at that yeah. point. Yeah. 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 And I think it's so fascinating and like completely unexpected if you're unfamiliar with these plants that 
in the summer they're carnivorous with like leafy soft tender fleshy leaves but then their winter form they actually develop much smaller uh very round full leaves like an echeveria Mm-hmm. Yeah. So let's talk about that. Yeah, so they grow, as we said, uh, very often on these rock faces. They have very shallow roots generally. Mm-hmm. even in I, That's one of the reasons I like to grow them in low pots is because we don't really need a lot of depth there. They just, yeah. their roots hold them on and, and get some moisture. But I think a lot of them just, a lot of their moisture comes from the air and it rains frequently. And so um, during the summer, while there's frequent, frequent rain, uh, they... Uh, they have the, the big sticky leaves that, that are basically like flypaper. And then, depending on the species and the area, uh, but toward fall, or sometimes as, as late as December, the plant will go through a change. And we often talk about dormancy just because it's easy to use that word, but it's not really a dormancy because the plant's actively growing. Yeah. So you'll just notice at some point, it's happening to a lot of mine right now, where the new leaves will come in and they'll be shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter and thicker. And those outer leaves will eventually dry off. And uh, you you end up with something like Matt said that looks a lot like an Echeveria or a Sempervivum, like a, like a hen and chicks. Mm-hmm. And uh, some of them uh, just kind of have a, it's, it's maybe a little bit of a rest that way. I mean, they do grow and, yeah. and you can put on size through the winter that way. Other ones bloom almost exclusively during that time. Really? And during the yeah. sum, summer, they're just putting on, on regular carnivorous leaves and no flowers. And then when they go down, Laoiana is one of those. It okay. blooms frequently through the winter. Some of them like to bloom kind of right on the on the on the cusp mm-hmm. on the transition so as they're waking up and and as they're going back into winter form they'll they'll send out some blooms interesting yeah yeah and the propagation of these is basically the same as succulents right yeah so so there's there's two two or three ways to do it you can divide it very often when you get a with a lot of species and hybrids when you get a bloom you'll very often get a division as well so you'll, the, the growing point will, will split. Yeah. So you'll end up with two growing points. And as you grow that, those along, then you can eventually pull them apart. Uh, when you pull those apart, very often leaves will fall off. And if you just set those leaves on the surface of a, of a mix, generally they will, kind of like an Echeveria will or a, or a jade plant, they'll start growing a little bud and you'll get... Um, uh, you'll get a little plant and then roots will come out and you can take that and grow it on. Now, and do you have to use the winter leaves for this or do the summer leaves? You work? don't have to. Uh, you can actually use pretty much any leaf. Uh, the only thing is that the uh, once you take a leaf off the plant, it's a bit of a race against time because yeah. it will start losing its, its moisture. And so the summer leaves are leaves that are growing are growing when there's abundant moisture and uh, so you're going to have to be more careful about moisture when that you don't want to have too much because you'll rot it but if you let it stay too dry it's going to dry off it kind of goes from the edge in and it's going to dry off before you get your plant established Uh, so it's easier to do it from uh, from the winter leaves because they're adapted to hold water they'll sit there for weeks sometimes and it some some varieties I've I've had take maybe three weeks before they start showing any activity. Other ones almost immediately. Mm-hmm. You, you pull it off and pfft, it, you've got a plant. Yeah. So uh, so yeah, the 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 winter leaves, if they're present, uh, are a little a little easier. There are some species you don't make winter leaves. Mm-hmm. They just have yeah. a little smaller leaves. They grow a little tighter in the in the winter, but no real succulent leaves at all. So. I see. You just get them when you get them. So I think with a lot of carnivorous plants in in your house, you may think like, all right, I need as much light as possible. Mm-hmm. I need fifty fifty peat per light. Um, what would you what would you you know say about these things? I mean, I I don't use peat and perlite for mm-hmm. instance for mine, but right. Do you do you think it they're requires... really adaptable? I mean, yeah, peat and perlite isn't my favorite uh, yeah. because it holds a lot of water. And if things are, are too wet, especially during that, uh, that uh, succulent time, yeah. uh, mm-hmm. then you can lose them to rot. And especially as they're kind of going in between, sometimes they can be a little bit, bit vulnerable. There's a, a disease called 
Browning Heart, uh, oh. and where where it's it's kind of insidious because uh, it's actually a combination of fungus and nematodes that open up the plant, and if the plant's a little stressed, sometimes it'll it'll succumb to it. So wow. you'll just notice your plant's not growing, and then you realize, oh, the whole center is rotted out. And I then think, heart turned brown. I yeah, think I've had it, this actually. Yeah, I've had it happen a couple yeah, times. Luckily, okay. not too much, but uh, and this but is it's happened to plants, not to you personally. Oh, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> You're I can confirm heart. plants, but yeah, it's question mark. By I, everyone's heard about Stephen's rotten yeah. heart. Yeah, his yeah. lips yeah. will just fall brown. Like, I don't want to bring mushy. it up. Yeah, but <laughs> but, yeah. Uh, but yeah, generally, uh, my preference is well, the, the first actual medium that I started using was 25% each of peat, perlite, pumice, and sand. Okay. And I just kind of used it a horticultural sand that I got at a, at a nursery. Mm-hmm. And uh, I've, I've still used something closer to that. I've diversified a little bit. So some of my plants, there are some that really don't want to be too wet. Uh, peat holds a lot of water. And uh, there's some people, especially in Europe, a lot of people really like vermiculite. I'm not right. wild about vermiculite because it tends to really hold it's, onto water. Yeah. But I suppose if you're using some of that in a mostly, uh, uh, what's the word mineral. I'm looking for? Mineral mix that doesn't hold water, then it's a good substitute for peat. Yeah. So I've tried all different things and, and I haven't seen that it's made a huge difference uh, the only really negative thing I've had is when I've used some some mixes, a lot of pumice and probably pumice is, it conducts water as well. Pumice and vermiculite in, I actually got some uh, kind of brown algae growth, uh, okay. and, which was kind of gross. You get this kind of brown jelly stuff when things are moist. So, so to get back to kind of how to grow them, uh, they grow beautifully under lights, uh, but you can also grow, do fairly well in an east window or a west window. Uh, when they're growing in their summer form, you generally want to keep them sitting in some water. You can let it dry up, but as soon as soon as soon as it's dried out in the tray, just put another centimeter in there mm-hmm. uh, or a little more. I've heard of people putting a lot more water, even having a whole inch or two inches of water in in there. I've never done that; it doesn't yeah. seem necessary, but it works for people. So. If it works, it works. Mm-hmm. And and also, this kind of depends on where you live. So our reality up here is different than Southern California, for example. One of my friends said, you know, uh, if I weren't using some a good bunch of peat in my soil, I could never keep things moist enough. Yeah. You know? So up here, I don't like to use quite so much peat because it tends to throw a lot of moss. And then you that's another issue. We can talk about it later. Mm-hmm. And then at some point... You can't really force your plants to go dormant. Um, they'll kind of tell you. Uh, and yeah. generally that, as far as I can tell, it has a lot to do with temperature and kind of ambient temperature. Uh, so, uh, or average temperatures. Mm-hmm. So when your days start getting cool to a day night difference is really nice. And of course in the Pacific Northwest, we're lucky here because we do get a real, uh, distinct day night temperature difference we don't have 90 degree humid nights like yeah. like Iowa uh, and I've heard people talk about when they sent plants that they were growing in Florida to someone in coastal California all of a sudden they colored up beautifully uh, because they were getting these low night temperatures uh, but as the day starts getting cooler as well then um, uh, then you'll start often getting that that um, that tighter growth, that thicker growth. And as soon as you start seeing it, it's good to start also holding back a little bit on the water. Uh, Instead of letting it sit a day, let it sit a couple days. The, the, the dry, I mean, uh, the, you won't let them go bone dry, but there are people, especially if you have real humid, if you live in a real humid area, uh, in the winter, you could let them go bone dry. Like we're talking about 80%, which, Mm, which you get, in the hills in Mexico, so so it might not be raining, but it's still humid because you've got water coming, yeah, atmospheric humidity. Yeah. So they're still getting, uh, they're still getting moisture. And remember, a lot of these plants grow in the same areas as tillandsias, as air plants do. 
and so they're getting their moisture also out of fog or out of the out of the air that might come in at night and then during mm-hmm. the daytime it's all dry again yeah so. so would it be appropriate if you didn't want to worry too much about keeping them wet in the winter to just miss them periodically you could do that I'm, I'm sure you could do it okay. i mean i yeah, missed I mine to fertilize that's another that's another um, issue here mm-hmm. but um but yeah you probably could uh i haven't tried that i just keep I just keep the the soil barely moist through the winter generally. Okay. And honestly, yeah. I'm not all that careful about it. There are people who can be really pedantic about it and say, oh, you must keep them bone dry from this date to that date. Uh, I let my plants tell me, really. Yeah. So you know, I'll yeah. start holding back when I see that they're starting to go down. Um, there are times that I thought I, you know, I was kind of confused because I had plants that were growing great guns in the middle of January. Mm-hmm. And I noticed that if I tried to hold back on water during that time, it didn't cause them to go dormant because there's other factors affecting it as well. And you can just end up with desiccated plants because they're not really ready to handle that. So, you know, if they don't want to go dormant, you don't really gain anything by forcing it. It's not a physiological requirement like it is, say, with with American pitcher plants where they have to get that dormancy. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, they're going to go into decline and maybe just stop growing but yeah so there's a lot like there's a lot of detail right like a lot of factors it sounds like Mm -hmm. but i think it's correct to say right that you can follow your plant's lead yeah it will start to maybe turn into this winter form kind of slowly you can then hold back water a little bit and there's not going to be any kind of quick do or die situation usually right where i think they're really one of the easier carnivorous plants to grow and especially as a house plant Mm -hmm. Uh, like I said they do beautifully under lights and I grow mostly under lights Um, but uh, I've seen beautiful plants growing just in an east window yeah in windows I think they you know sort of eat easily and we can kind of get into that next but you know they they can catch gnats you know what they catch them well and mm-hmm. um it's not like something like a maybe a fly trap where it needs probably larger prey to trip mm-hmm. those hairs but yeah how are you fertilizing so there's or- one brand of fertilizer that a lot of people are really um uh that really really like it's really popular among carnivorous plant people and that's called maxi mm-hmm. and it's kind it. of a seaway yeah. seaweed uh, based fertilizer usually you do like a fourth strength though uh, yeah or you, some people do it so light that I, I wonder if it if it's actually even doing anything. If you're putting are, like a, a fourth of maxi to a fourth te- teaspoon of maxi to a gallon of water is is not really, you know, that much. That's fertilizer. what I was first told. But I know people who are doing almost full strength and not having any problem. I did something like a f- I can't remember now how much I started out with. Uh but I did burn plants once with I it. I have burnt plants too. Yeah, and I, uh, especially if you put a lot on and it pools yeah. in the edge of a leaf. Some of the some of the pinguiculas have the little the little slobber collar around the edge. You know, the little yes. upturned edge. I that, love that little yes, portion. Yeah. Yes, yeah. This yeah. is where the leaf on the edge kind of lifts up just a little bit to create a bit of a tray, so that as it produces its digestive juices with insects. They don't just roll off the exactly. leaf edge. Like that, yeah. Yeah. yeah, especially on these ones that grow on vertical surfaces. So it helps that would be important. Yeah. Yeah. hold on to what it's caught. Uh, so if that pools in there and then it, it evaporates, it gets concentrated and that can burn a, a part of the leaf. Okay. Um, and lately, you think this is like a foliar spray? It's a foliar spray, okay. uh, like every two weeks or so. Okay. But okay. actually, um, I was talking to Damon at California Carnivores and he said... I believe it was him. Actually, I was talking to him on uh, um, on Instagram and mm-hmm. messaging. So I don't know if it was him, but I assume because he's the one that's really yeah. into the pings. So thank you for this. Uh, but uh, he said that they were experimenting with Schultz's cactus fertilizer. Huh? Really? Wow. And yeah, and and it kind of makes sense because you're not you don't really need a whole lot of extra nitrogen and cacti use less so it's, yeah. it's a fairly low first number and you also don't just the normal concentration of schultz's it's still it's pretty gentle because you don't put the cactus aren't heavy feeders exactly yeah so it's 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 ideal for plants that aren't heavy feeders so you That's don't have to worry about 
you know, let's see, uh, it says how many drops for a gallon, so, or how many ounces, and I have to divide that. No, mm -hmm. you just do it just like it says on the package. Yeah. And I haven't had any burning, and yeah, my plants seem to be doing well, so I think I might be a convert. Oh, oh well, okay. that sounds like yeah. a good yeah. next step. The way that I grow mine is mostly just being fed through the insects that are in my sure. apartment. Yeah. Uh, and I find that the way that they that a lot of carnivorous plants like Drosera like to grow invite the problem of fungus gnats. Yes. Because that constant moisture means fungus, which means that the gnats will come, their whole life cycle will be happily taking place in the conditions that you need these plants to grow in. But if you throw some of these butterwort, well, which is their common name, by the way. Yeah, butterwort. Yeah. yeah. Um, when you throw some of these into your mix, I find that that problem resolves itself very quickly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't have a lot of fungus gnats at my place. I mean, yeah. I do have some, Very but, hazardous environment but it's, for them. it's kind of, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, sort of like a little tragedy. You think of the little the little fungus gnats that, that hatches out of the soil and takes its first flight and then says, well, let's land somewhere. And the first place oh, it lands so is, many a, wrong choices. Is, a, is an acid uh, enzyme uh, <laughs> bug eating place. So, oh, But I yeah. would also say that since fungus gnats are attracted to carbon dioxide, which means that they actively fly up your nose when you're watching television, is that I'm not why? too bummed out. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, I don't remember what podcast I was listening okay. to. I'm if, hearing a cool. traumatic story here. Please share. Uh, well, there were times when Brian and I would be watching television and he'd be freaking out about how my plants were making fruit flies fly up his nose and it didn't matter the pedantics of like brian those aren't fruit flies these are fungus gnats. oh that's you, great yeah. time oh well that in that case it's just fine yeah, yeah. It, it, it does not help to try to win that argument by correcting yeah. the species that's flying up your nose yeah, um, i guess not yeah but anyway i haven't had that problem since i added the huh. things to my collection yeah i've got friends uh, uh, who play a lot of music and they actually uh put a, a spoof uh, a CD of funny songs out, and one of them was called Face Bugs. And, and they were talking about fungus mats, but what do they want? <laughs> yeah, they want some of the later Face bags. Bugs, drive me insane. Face so, Bugs. Yeah, so, you know, all right, you're, you're probably not going to walk into a store and see, you know, 30 different pins <coughs> no. to buy. But if people can choose, what would you steer them toward as like a starter species? Well, yeah, species are hybrids. Um, it's funny, you know, in Europe, uh, like here we have the Venus flytraps and uh, sometimes sundews, most often Venus flytraps and uh, pitcher plants of various kinds into little death cubes. Mm -hmm. In Europe, uh, there's a couple of, um, of pings that are also really common. Hmm. Uh, cool. And one of those is a hybrid called Tina. Okay. I've and heard of that one. Uh, I'm trying to remember now. Shoot, I should have written this down. Is it Morinensis by Ehlersy? No, that's that's Pirouette. Um, I can't remember what the hybrid is. Well, you know, but, I will look that up right now. Well, there you go. Oh, what you Tina see? is, you're saying? Yeah. What, oh, what? I don't think it's Ehlersy, is it? No, it's not Ehlersy. That would make no sense. But uh, I, I do have oh, Tina. It is Zechari. a primary hybrid between Agnata and Zachary. Okay, so Agnata oh. and Zechariah. Yeah, those are Zachari. both good, good um, vigorous plants. Mm -hmm. That makes sense because it doesn't have much of a winter form. It it gets a little tighter in the winter, but it doesn't go down to a hen and chicks. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Uh, it does have really attractive lavender colored flowers. It has huge, big flowers, and it's mm -hmm. vigorous. I mean, you mm -hmm. start with one, and if it's happy, within six months, you'll probably have five growing points. I, yeah, I already have one. I think I've had it for three months, maybe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm and then there's also there are a lot of very huge plants online. Huge. Yes. Yeah. Well, you saw one of our people in the local group brought a bowl, yeah. maybe a foot and a half wide that was completely full of them. Mm -hmm. wow. Because what they'll do is they'll also end up making like an offshoot down at the base and that will basically etiolate its way out to the edge. Etiolation wow. is when yeah. when you get an elongation of a stem because it's not getting enough light. So you'll yeah. it'll just kind of grow along until it gets to a point where it gets enough light and then it starts growing as a rosette and so on and so on and you'll it'll fill a bowl oh, so, uh, so kind of and there's also difference. uh it's kind of sister hybrid called gina which is the same hybrid the other way around 
So we had Moronensis by Ehlers, uh, excuse me, Zechari, and then we have Zechari by Moronensis. Okay. So it it's the like same two species, and it looks very similar, but the flowers are a little have a little more distinct okay. uh, markings. It's, like it's real pretty. Almost. It's like Gee. it's very pretty. But All anyway. right. So if you, if you can find it, maybe Tina would be a good one to Tina's start with. Tina's a good one. Uh, yeah, I, it's a fairly common one in. For example, companies that are selling carnivorous plants, but also Moronensis is yeah. a, is a fairly common. It does have a distinct winter form. There are some people who are kind of disappointed it when it goes into winter form because it's not catching bugs. To me, that's part of the charm. It's I like the cycle of it. You know, and I'll admit, I first didn't like that idea. Mm -hmm. Honestly, I was like, oh, I don't want a succulent around here. This is my carnivorous plant like table, and this yeah. is the cool thing. How do I stave off this terrible winter? But mm -hmm. yeah, I've really come around to appreciating that. I mean, the there are some really interesting winter forms that are beautiful in their mm -hmm. own right. I think especially yeah. I'm gonna say Gypsicola. I love. Yeah, it has this like kind of ombre like green to red, really like a little kind of pom pom looking mm -hmm. thing. Super pretty. Yeah, really really tight. So, tiny. and I'm gonna throw up, you know, kind of an maybe a wild card one. I would steer people toward reticulata if they can find that. Hmm. I found that one super hardy. It's it one is. of the first ones I've had. Huh. It does not flower easily, but it will go. I've in... heard that mine flowers. No, mine flowers so yeah. easy. <laughs> I'm so perfect. Oh, this okay. is the first time that I've yeah. seen Stephen get you like know, truly yeah. bitter. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> truly bitter. No, so I, but I've probably had mine five. flowers and yours doesn't. Yeah, I've had at least. I've had this in multiple. I've actually moved this around trying mm -hmm. to get that to happen, but no, it won't. Oh. But I I do find it really hardy though. It has been incredibly forgiving. Like I'll forget to water it. I yeah. put it in weird spots that like I should never put a ping in, and it's fine. And that's one of those ones that grows. Like at the base of cacti. Really? It's, okay. Yeah, it always even even during its its summer form, uh, even during its carnivorous phase, it still looks kind of succulent. You know, yeah, it's that's true. Thick leaved, and you yeah. can take pullings of it anytime. You pull a leaf off, throw it on, and you know yeah. you've got plants. There's a few like that, uh, but but that's right. a really good example. So is Morinensis one of the parents of Weezer? Uh, let's see, Weezer. Weezer's one that um, Matthew has that has yeah. done like super well. Splits a lot. It's a large plant, right? Yeah. yeah. The, the the reason I ask if that's part of its parentage is because is because I'm looking at some of these pictures and uh, the foliage Sorry. looks similar. Apple yeah. green with like a pink blush, and the flowers have that really lurid fuchsia that I'm so in love with. Mm -hmm. uh, but Weezer is a great plant. Well, it, and I mean, I, I don't like the flowers, but I never cut them off. It is the plant that I would personally recommend. Yeah. It was yeah. the first one that I grew. That was super easy to propagate mm -hmm. as well. Yeah, right? and, and something that I found, I've had, I've got like, I think five different hybrids, and I'm sure they're all plants that came from you, uh, whether that was directly or through Stephen or the Sun Shop, but this is the one of all of them that, even though the flowers are my least favorite, every time that it blooms, it seems to split out into multiple plants. Yeah, and I actually yeah, it shared, does do that. Yeah, I, I shared so many little offshoots at a recent plant sale that we went to, or, or a plant swap rather, and now I have like a couple little divisions myself that look very sad, but I am not worried about them because my, my mother plant at one point was this huge clump of at least 12 distinct baby plants. Oh. It got to the point that I went to pull off a dead leaf and the whole plant just came off the soil because yep. they have such yeah. a shallow little root system. Yes. And also I might add that when you, when you have a flower stalk that, um, that is spent and it dries up and it just looks like this little flimsy thing. Yeah. So you just want to take it and yank it off like you would a nose hair or something. You know? oh, I've yeah. done that. No, I've, I've, what happens is the whole oh plant God. will come out. They I hold on to the whole thing. Use a pair of scissors. Yeah. I was trying to pinch it off. Yeah, yeah same. I was just like, whoa, there's like some. <laughs> yeah, so, yep. so actually, there's your plant daddy podcast pingicula tip. Yeah. Don't just try to pull off dead foliage. Don't. It won't right. come freely. Yeah, really. <laughs> foliage, foliage will come off fairly easy if it's really completely it's dried flowers, off. It'll yeah. come off, but the flower stalks, they're, they're, really they're tight on there. Their flowers. Yeah. yeah. Uh, there's another variety called another hybrid called Sethos, S E T H O S, mm -hmm. and that is actually the same hybrid as Weezer. It's just Wait, another selection. Yeah, it's the oh. same same mother species, which I, I can't that. remember right offhand either. Uh, but um, 
and Weiser or Weza, I think it's a German yeah. one actually. Mm, yeah. But uh, that one is one of those that shows up in in the shops a lot in Europe, mm. and it and it's oh. been. Sorry, I just have to interject. Yeah. This is exciting. It is uh, parented by Moranensis, but its other parent is uh, Ellersia. Ellersia. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. my, hey, my plant. My yes, pink. exactly. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. Proceed. So, uh, and another nice thing about, about uh, Sethos and Wazer, oh, I was going to say, it's it's been circulated so much in Europe, uh, along with Tina, that there's also people have redone the the same cross and put other things mm-hmm. out there so you got stuff from tissue culture being sold as wazer and it's not actually wazer there's a bunch of fake wazers out there interesting uh, because it's a selection so yeah uh, the thing that sets wazer apart is it has this really distinct white line right down the middle of its lower petal and sethos has pretty much the same color maybe a little lighter but but it has more like a star and not a line it almost oh. looks like a star in the middle okay and yeah you know you could do that cross any number of times and every little pod is going to give you you know a whole slew of different different plants coming out of it yeah. so we can talk about that later too so but it is a, um, what I was going to say is both of those are, are um, uh, fertile hybrids because some of them are oh, okay. so you can actually it's given me some really good hybrids as well awesome so if I find myself with one of these plants that we've just talked Mm -hmm. about um the way that i treated them was when i first was growing them i just kept them in the pots that i got them Mm -hmm. i had them in a cash pot that i could flood with water periodically i wasn't too careful about making sure that it was a low level they were in a really coarse uh like pumicey kind of mix i don't know if there was any actual organic matter in there Mm -hmm. so they did really well I transitioned them into pumice planters because I could just sit those in a like little bowl dish of water and keep that level high and then it would wick up through the substrate. But I noticed that there was a lot of moss and I personally thought that that was beautiful. I loved the look. It is. Yeah. But you mentioned that that was something that could pose problems. It can uh, because the air is full of spores. I mean, I think if you live in the desert, maybe not as much. Yeah, but, but we're if in you, the Pacific we're Northwest. We're in the Pacific Northwest. <laughs> mm-hmm. You know, the moss takes over and it, it grows on our yeah. sidewalks through the yeah. winter. Yeah. And uh, if it weren't for, for our dry summer, we'd probably have slippy, slidey, moss-covered sidewalks all year round. Yeah. Uh, so all year round. So... Um, uh, yeah, what happens is this moss can get really thick. The type that mm-hmm. grows, especially on, I think the, the spores actually mostly come with the peat. But uh, when that gets growing on there, uh, it can turn into a really thick carpet. And if your plant's large, and if it's spe- especially if it's one of those that, that doesn't have a real tight winter form, uh, it's not quite so big a deal because that's it's going to be a little shaded out and it's not going to be so vigorous. But if you have a small plant in a pot and it's going through winter form, but the moss is still growing, it can actually you can actually find yourself with the plant down below that moss. Oh, and when it oh. comes time for it to grow out, uh, it can't. It's trying to put its its roots out along the surface and maybe just under the surface. The roots don't grow down into the substrate. So what you'll see, if you if you let that go too far, you'll notice that your plants are struggling, they're getting kind of subsumed, and you open it up, and you'll see that there's hardly any root there. Yeah. There's this long stem that's trying to keep up with the moss growth. And uh, yeah, I've lost plants that way. I have uh, as well. And especially some small seedlings that was, you know, I, I just kind of got, got careless and let them go, and then I realized, oh, there's no plant there anymore yeah so. so for me if i touch the substrate and it's like a tough sort of turfy kind of moss what i'll what i'll do is just take you know some tweezers and kind of pick away that top layer of really tough moss and i'll sort of replace the substrate and like we've been saying right the root system is so kind of like barely existent right yeah. you can kind of pick these up put them down in fresh substrate and mine have mostly recovered from that. yeah they Is usually that bounce back do? pretty quickly actually i'll often just uh grab the edge of the moss that and just pull it all up okay. probably with the plant as well sometimes and just break it apart 
knock off whatever falls off easily mm-hmm. and just throw the rest of the way. I throw it out in the garden. It'll it's compost now. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, and then the the you know, fill fill with new substrate and. Uh, Usually within a month or so, you'll start seeing new moss growing on there. But you know, it'll it'll it always be coming it. along. But yeah, yeah, yeah. And I've I've have heard people say they have no trouble with moss. I don't know quite I've how heard, they do that. I've heard that as well. Like one friend down in California, and he uses peat. He washes his peat. Okay. And uh, uh, I suppose that could definitely help. Although I, it can't, I can't imagine that you could really ever wash all the the, the spores I out of either. peat. I don't, yeah. And and especially if you're growing them with other ones. I mean, the moss grows and it does send up spore things. So unless you're going to be clipping them back all the time to make sure it doesn't send spores, there's we're breathing moss spores yeah. as we talk. We're God probably knows, five percent you know, spore. Yeah, we're yeah. probably yeah. in the northwest. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And the rest is corn. So mm-hmm. what I could probably do then, if I have my, my pumice dish or some whatever vessel I'm growing my, my plants in, mm-hmm. if I notice the moss really getting intense, I might just kind of manicure it back. Yeah, you can, you can just out, pull, it, it, pull it off. I actually had some you know, big chunks of pumice that I was mm-hmm. growing the plants directly on. And they were going great for a couple of years, and it just got to the point where the moss was getting a little yeah. out of hand. So I just pulled the plants off. Mm-hmm. And and went over them with like a scouring brush, oh. and, and started over again. Mm-hmm. You know, okay. you can do that. I mean, it was kind of sad because it was looking really cool, but yeah. but the thing is, moss isn't the only spore out there. There's also fern spores that come along. I have liverwort uh, on mine. Yeah, liverwort, yeah, liverwort. and liverwort can be a pain. Yeah, because it can grow really fast and it can grow right over your plant. So you have oh. to kind of keep an eye on that. There's there's a rock at the sun shop that's got. Uh, a bunch of liverwort in the middle and I go through that every every month or so I kind yeah. of take a knife or something and just kind of yeah push it back so, a little bit but I like a little because it's cool yeah. yeah so we have these kind of you know dewy fleshy plants right and I think in a lot of house plant you know circles right or people growing house plants think about humidity mm-hmm. is that something you think about at all with pings like oh better not keep- really very much only only for seedlings okay uh, and for for pullings to a lesser extent uh if you keep things too wet you'll you'll rot your seedlings too so you have to be a little careful uh but um otherwise no i don't think it too much i mean people have an idea generally about carnivorous plants and and it's not coincidental i mean a lot of the literature a lot of the 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 care sheets that for years and years that came with carnivorous plants of all kinds emphasize this really really high humidity as if mm. they're and there's an idea that if they're carnivorous plants they must come from the depths of the drippy rainforests and yeah. uh, most of them don't jungles. some of the nepenthes def- definitely do come from some of the most disgusting habitats known for man <laughs> you know like cloud yeah, forest yeah. but uh That's terrible yeah or but uh but yeah most of them don't and so i wouldn't worry too much about it uh, they're not like ferns where mm-hmm. you know if you forget to water for two days suddenly it's all crisp the it, it's not an issue with it, these plants yeah that's my experience as well i mean these are next to succulents like 30 yeah. percent humidity routinely right it'll be maybe different mm-hmm. in their little tray and but... i have to say i'm really happy with how resilient they are in cultivation mm-hmm. because i have definitely let mine routinely get too dry and they don't seem to have slowed down or been terribly bothered unless i really press that yeah yeah yeah, you can desiccate them. If they're in summer growth and you forget to water and you let them sit dry, they will shrivel up. You can kill mm-hmm. a ping that way. I think it but takes a while, it in does. my experience. Yeah, it does. Really... It does. I've never but lost I've seen one. people. I feel like I should have. I've seen people, usually when I've seen it is when like someone who's a little bit new is, is concerned that their, their pink wicula hasn't gone into winter form and you know it's november and it's still growing summer leaves and so they start holding back on water Mm -hmm. trying to make it go dormant and uh and it doesn't and then they show pictures my ping's not looking good and it's all kind of shriveled and and half dead looking and that's what happens if you try to force the issue you have to you have to hold back the water when they start um going a little dormant i really have this you can hold them back a little bit but yeah don't overdo it it, it just seems to me that this is a plant that is very stubborn and they're like, weird. Totally they're, reliable. Just, they are. they're just fucking weird <laughs> they plants, basically. Yeah. You know, uh, you'll, I have I have plants 
like I moved this spring and I was in one place where things were not quite so well ventilated mm-hmm. and things were warm and everything was wait you know they'd gone mostly mostly into winter form and everything was waking up and it was warm and kind of humid in there. And I moved to the new place and it had a lot better ventilation. And suddenly we got cool nights again. And all these plants went dormant again, or they went into winter form. <laughs> oh, and yeah. often once they do that, then it seems like it's almost like a like a switch. They're gonna stay that way for a few months. Mm-hmm. So I had plants that were basically in winter form all the way through the summer. And, and then <laughs> once fall came, then they all said, oh, let's wake up now. So I have plants now that are that are just coming into full summer growth other ones came um kind of into summer growth and and they were just getting going and now they're going back into winter because it's they're they're getting back on track Mm -hmm. so so the term summer and winter growth is sort of a misnomer because the plant doesn't care where you are in the calendar exactly yeah (laughs) i mean it is in nature it's an issue yeah uh so so we can t- it's accurate to talk about it that way because that's right. what they do do in nature where you've got they're really completely exposed to everything nature there is giving them in- including changing daylight and changing humidity mm-hmm. and and rainfall and all of that in the house it's a little different and so yeah the way they respond can be very different for different people i'm glad that you mentioned light because that was something that i wanted to mm-hmm. ask about light duration for these since they're so easy to grow under light mm-hmm. uh what do i want to aim for during the summer so i grow like i said i grow my own under under t5s and under leds and uh in the summer, I probably around 16, 17 hours a day. It's the same. And then it, in the winter, I take it down to about 12, 11 or 12. Mm-hmm. Now, my yeah. plants are growing under lights that have a long light duration like mm-hmm. that. Yeah. Is it advisable to change that throughout the year for them? I don't I don't think you need to. Okay. I mean, it depends on what you're growing too. Like I said, some of the species, for example, uh, will do their blooming when they're in winter form. Mm-hmm. So if you're growing yeah. them in a way that you'll never get winter form, if you never get that succulent form, then you won't see flowers. Okay. So there's some of the, especially some of the little tiny ones, they, they like um, uh, Rotonda Flora. Uh-huh. You know, it has, it, it makes this nice carpet and, and you have a winter rosette that's maybe a centimeter and a half wide and the flower is almost as wide as the as the rosette. So wow. you yeah. wouldn't really want to miss that. Yeah. Those are really yeah. cool looking yeah. actually. Yeah. yeah. A lot of these just remind me of primroses, of gisneriads. Mm-hmm. I think there's a lot that you could do if you found the yeah. right one for, for your space. Sure. And there was one horticulturalist uh, who was really uh, a specialist in carnivorous plants named Adrian Slack. You mm-hmm. can still find his book on carnivorous plants. And he really hoped that uh, that pinguiculas would catch on as house plants, almost like uh, uh, like, like African, African violets. Yeah, <laughs> because the flowers, some of the flowers are so beautiful. and and as more and more hybrids come out, you get really interesting flower colors that you'd never yeah. find in nature. And so that's so. it's kind of an interesting question. Like there's some I, doubles out there. So. Yeah, yeah. So I wonder that sometimes. Why are these not more popular? Because as, I think as just house like, plants. Yeah, just for the reasons that you mentioned. Some of mine, uh, when they're blooming, I really do wonder why they're not commonly found. Mm-hmm. Since. Yeah. They're maybe the most generally appealing carnivorous I mean, plant it's, flowers. Yeah, I mean, a lot of people have fungus nets. Like, yeah. I just feel like... I think a lot of it just people don't don't know about it. And a lot of people who were growing them are carnivorous plant specialists. Yeah. So they grow them. But, but yeah, it just hasn't made that, that jump. I mean, me. that's something that's happening now kind of with the carnivorous plant craze yeah. i mean i'm with the general plant craze not the carnivorous plant craze but mm. but more people are getting interested in plants in general and at the sun shop our former manager jerry addington is growing amazing pitcher plants so we always have a big selection of those and people see them for the first time it's pretty much every day that i'm there somebody comes by and says oh my god what are these yeah mm-hmm. and and they're shocked that you can grow them outside that they're yeah. that easy because there's this just general uh, perception among the public that carnivorous plants are difficult. Mm-hmm. They're like trying to grow orchids. I mean, there are easy orchids too, but yeah, just like with orchids, there's an idea. Oh, you know, you need to have a greenhouse. You need this. You need that. Yeah. You need to have these exacting conditions. And some of them are that way, but most of them aren't. Mm-hmm. Yeah, 
I think that these are fantastic, and I hope that people listening get on board. Oh yeah. no, yeah, these are yeah. a well, favorite they of definitely mine. have here. I mean, I bring in uh, say nine or twelve or fifteen pings yeah. in the store, and they're generally sold off within a day or two. People yeah. are hungry for them, and well, I don't have the space to do the kind of propagation that I would like to. But yeah. Uh, just get those prices real high when the demand is, exactly. is high and the supply right. is yeah, low. Yeah, you know, the, it'll be the new uh, yeah. Pilea pepperomioides. Bob, that's right. Bob Everybody is will be paying $80 for a two-inch yeah. pot. Right. Um, <laughs> you know, I don't know if I'd pay 80 but these are worth it, and I think that people should check them out. Yeah, these are really... Definitely. Yeah. Something... They're the Pokemons of carnivorous plants, they basically. They are. Well, Steven... Lots of different colors, and they're all you can keep them all in little pots, and I mm-hmm. mean... Yeah. When people ask you that incredibly rude question, like, how many plants do you have... I mean, I, I just Why tell them, I'm like, rude? listen, you know, I have... Steven doesn't want to have to account for I'm like, listen, I don't want to have to count. And if I say okay. 200, am I weird or whatever? No, but, but I'm just you're... saying you can, you know, you can have a dish. You can have 20 yes. interesting pings just in this dish. So it's, a re- a really... it's a really good point because, yeah, yeah, yeah. you can do it on a, on a big piece of big chunk of pumice and it's yeah. beautiful One you can do it in a dish and where as you know i love nepenthes i would love dearly to have the kind of room to grow nepenthes but you get a little cute nepenthes in a four inch pot and yeah. two years later it's going to be a 10 foot long vine it's, that's you know all over the place audrey too so yep. yeah pings don't do that you know i like to keep a couple of every species so if i lose one mm-hmm. uh but really it's not going to get much bigger than a four inch yeah. Pot, unless it's pink wicked gigantia, which gets up to yeah. a foot wide. And so I probably won't have a house full of those. But uh, <laughs> but you could have but a couple. Still, I could have a few. Yeah. 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 Stephen sure. has a really beautiful display in his bedroom that just has like all kinds of beautiful little jewel like pings growing on a mossy pumice stone. They're yeah. surrounded by individual pots of similarly beautiful little yeah. pings. Yeah, I think it's easy to have a lot of variety. Mm-hmm. And it's all just on one shelf. Mm-hmm. And also, you know, they change through the year. I mean, it's yeah. not just not just the winter and summer form too. But you can have a plant that's growing big, flat green leaves in doing this during the summer, and then when you start getting those cool nights in the fall, all of a sudden, it'll get brilliant pink or or fading through different colors. They are jewel like. <laughs> Some of them are like little glistening bubble gum. Like oh, yeah. infection. The colors kind yeah. of seem fake at first. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's so... a lot of purple ones. Yeah, purple. Just the pinks. really well. There are several of them that are uh, hummingbird pollinated, Ooh. and hummingbirds generally go on visual cues. Yeah, and they see reds, they see hot pinks, and all of that. So oh. that's a, there actually is one that's um, that's a brilliant red one. Is and, that uh, uh, Lawiana? Lawiana. Yeah. I'm, I'm looking at pictures. And that's right almost here. certainly a hum. Yeah, it's, it's a hummingbird pollinated plant. Anything that crimson is definitely yeah. a draw yeah. for a hummingbird. And most of them are not. Uh, most of them are not fragrant. Mm-hmm. There's one. Uh, there's oh, one agnata that has a scented flower. Oh, okay. I think I've heard of and that. And it was yeah. one of the first ones that I ever grew, and I ended up killing it in that my warm winter that I couldn't keep things cool enough for them. But uh, damn it, I was going to try uh, to do leaf pulling. Well, you you can. Um, I've, uh, so I got more. So, oh, okay. Uh, somebody gave me a couple small plants off of hers, and so now they're going crazy again. I love it. And a uh, plant. I I have to say that. When mine bloomed the first time, I couldn't catch any fragrance. Okay. But she said that she caught it. So I don't know if there's more than one form of it running around. So Sometimes, I'll get another chance. Yeah. And and I'm not killing them really now. So eating on some yeah. plants. Yeah. So, yeah, I think that's about it from us, right? Yeah. Um, like this, else? this answers a lot of questions. I think that this is a fantastic group of plants. If you're looking yeah. to get into carnivorous plants, don't know where to start, feel intimidated. Stephen and I both readily recommend the Mexican pings to people. Yeah, I think it's really approachable. And like Bob has sort of touched on, there's tons of depth here. Yeah. Tons of species, tons of ways to keep them. Yeah, and, yeah, and you can kind of go as deep as you want into mm-hmm. it, but it's still a plant that's fairly easy to grow as well. If you just want to have a nice plant to grow on your windowsill, it's going to bloom and make nice leaves and also eat some fungus gnats. Yeah. You know, you don't have to have an entire wall covered with them like some yeah. people i know but you probably will soon <laughs> but i love the way it's that if you have 400 pings it can take up a very so, tidy little area very small footprint okay, yeah trust me, this yeah. is much better than if you collect ficus like i 400 do 400 monsteras or yeah. Something. yeah yeah those are much <laughs> larger plants yeah. mm-hmm. um but you know just just the response that we were getting on instagram when you posted pings in the past yeah 
I don't think this is a type of plant that is super widely known. So I hope yeah. that people are inspired by this episode and start taking a look for some of the ones that they might be able to find locally mm -hmm. or be emboldened and order yeah. some online because yeah. they are very available and they are really easy to propagate. So you're not going to be spending huge amounts of money to get your hands on a tidy little collection of these. And luckily also you can be pretty safe ordering them over Etsy or something because not too many people are uh, are selling fake stuff from China, which yeah. is a bit of an issue with uh, some of the carnivorous plants. Yeah. Like blue Venus flytrap, yes, bonsai, still, I uh, yeah. whatever. Yeah. The, I'd still be a little careful. but Yeah, if, if you're going to order, make sure it's a reputable person right. and you can see pictures of the plant for sale, yeah. all those little things. But um, I'm really excited that you were here to talk to us about Oh, it's great to be here. Yeah. Thanks um, for having thanks me. Thanks a lot. And yeah, we can point people to Bob's Instagram. I don't know if there's any anything else you want to plug here, but uh, uh, yeah, there's some cool pictures of pings there. I mm -hmm. mean, we've mentioned it, but have we directly said that uh, Bob is one of the people who you'll visit when you go to the Indoor Sun Shop? Yeah, which one is one of, of our, our favorite places, and that's where I got my first... One of my favorite places. Yes. <laughs> it's so where I got all my first If you are plans. looking for yeah, an actual... If you're in the Seattle area. Yeah. Actual... Okay, so thank you so much for coming. Uh, listeners, you. you should all start looking for this plant. If you are a succulent person, this is a plant that is sometimes a succulent. If you are a carnivorous plant person, this plant is carnivorous. If sometimes. You... Yes, sometimes, occasionally, yeah. when it's not succulent. And if you like... You know, cute little quaint cottagey flowers that you get off of African violets. This is a plant that'll if, give you that right. same joy. If you like Pokemon, you'll like this plant. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. um, so, and Stephen's always talking about he likes a plant that does more. And this is a plant that does a lot. Has several tricks. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So check it out. Get your hands on some. Right. Anything else you want to say, Stephen? Uh, no, it's been great to have Bob here. Yeah, okay, so this is Plant Daddy Podcast, so thank you for listening. Don't forget to check us out on Instagram or on Twitter, and check out Indoor Sun Shop and Bob Beer, who has been our fantastic guest today. We're looking forward to you tuning in next time. Thank you for listening, and happy growing. Thanks. Thanks.